As we continue in our series, What We Believe and Why, um, where this is the second part of the uh, doctrine of love, love. And uh, let's go to Lord in prayer as we get started the message this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for um, the important subject of love. And I pray that you would bless the message. May it be what you want it to be for your honor and glory. And may you work in each heart and lives. May you change us uh, and uh, mold us into more uh, of the image of your son. And that uh, we would uh, demonstrate, have the love for you that we should have. And also love for others you want us to have as well. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read uh, the, uh, what we, the doctrine of what we believe about love. And uh, we believe that we should demonstrate love for others, not only toward fellow believers, but also those who are not believers, are living in sin, or oppose us. We should deal with those who oppose us graciously, gently, patiently, and humbly. God forbids the stirring up of strife, the taking of revenge, or the threat or use of violence as a means of resolving personal conflict or obtaining personal justice. Although God commands us to abhor sin, we are to love and pray for any person who engages in such sinful actions. And so last week, just to bring you up to speed here, last week we looked at uh, what is the definition of love. Uh, in a general sense, it's to be pleased with, it, to regard with affection on account of some qualities which excite pleasing sensations or desire of gratification. And so that is when you are very much attached to something. You just love something or someone because they please you. There's something about them that, that, it, that, that causes you to grow in your affection for them. Uh, that, so that's a, uh, what we often consider uh, when we think of love. And then the more of a general definition is to have benevolence or goodwill for. And so that's just more of a broad, uh, you may not be even that close to a person. You might not know much about them. You might not even know much about them as far as what, uh, what it is. Maybe there isn't even a characteristic or quality that uh, especially pleases you about them. But you still have a, a goodwill for them. You, actually, you have a benevolence toward them that you want the best for them. And so that is more of a, a broad definition of, of love. And we looked at a couple of scriptures last week of 1 Corinthians uh, 13, also Romans chapter 5. And the greatest demonstration of love is, uh, is Christ's death on the cross. Uh, God, uh, while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. God commended his love toward us and that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. And so he, uh, uh, the greatest demonstration was the giving of life. Uh, the giving of his life. There's a verse also, no, greater love hath no man than this, and a man laid down his life for his friends. And so love, the, the lump running theme of love is that love gives. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, as we did last week, you see what the characteristics are of love or charity. Uh, and charity, I think the, in the word very specific there, uh, why is that charity used uh, in, in English uh, in the King James Bible is that it, it indicates some sort of action or doing, that you're, it, it has to do with giving. When we think of giving to charity, it has to do with uh, uh, doing something for someone else or uh, 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 giving something to someone else. And so that is the, uh, that, that's the, the running theme of love is that love gives. It's what love gives and does for others. And the greatest of, uh, part of love is the sacrifice uh, of even one's life, one's very life, uh, is the ultimate sacrifice. And lust is the opposite of love, because lust takes. It's lust is about what is in it for me, what, what pleases me, what is, it's all about me and what I have and what I'm gaining from this. That is lust. That's not true love. Somebody can say, oh, I love somebody, but, uh, but when that love is based on, well, here's what I get from them, uh, that is not a proper exercise of love. That has more having to do, it's a self-centered kind uh, of love, not, uh, and it, it turns into more of lust, uh, because lust is what uh, we get out of it. It's all about what I want, what pleases me, instead of what can I give, what do I do for others. Uh, and then the question is, we've, we've heard, uh, how many of you heard, have heard the uh, saying, uh, love is love? You may have heard that, yeah. <laughs> You've probably, yeah. Most of us, I think, have heard that. Uh, love is love. Well, love is love. Is love love? Is all love equal? Is all love equal? You know, the Bible actually has an answer for that. I'm glad the Bible has the answers. 
Mm. You know, the Bible has a lot of answers, even things we might not think of a Bible verse off the top of my head. Like, there's an answer for that. Love is love. Is all love the same? Is all love equal? Well, there's an answer for that. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. Inordinate affection. Remember, one of the definitions of love is affection. It's, it's uh, something about a person seeing a pleasing quality in someone else that, that causes you to have affection for them. Inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, inordinate, I think we know what affection means, and it's tie-in with, with love. But inordinate means irregular, disorderly, excessive, immoderate, not limited to rules prescribed or to usual bounds as an inordinate love of the world or an inordinate desire of fame. And so, not limited to rules prescribed or to usual bounds or irregular. So even when people say love is love, that I can love who I want if I'm a you know, if I'm a man and, uh, you know, that a man will say, well, love is love and I'm going to love another man uh, in the way that he should only love a woman as far as gonna, who's gonna, who would be his wife. But I'm gonna, so men with men, men, women loving women, and, and then there's some that, well, they claim, well, I love I, you know, men and women or some, not just men and women, but all genders. Can't limit it to just two genders. Um, so, that, so they will say, and what the world says is, hey, look, look, love is love. I mean, for one, love, this is love for one person, this is love for the other, and there's no difference. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Inordinate affection. There is such thing as inordinate affection, which means it's irregular, it's disorderly, disorderly it's excessive and moderate, not limited to rules prescribed to the usual bounds. So who, who is a man supposed to love? Well, a man is supposed to love his wife. Who is a wife supposed to love? Well, a wife is supposed to love her husband. And so God's bound of the romantic kind of love, that, um, that, that love that's only to be between spouses, is meant for a man and a woman, a husband and wife. Anything outside of that, any love that is is the type of romantic love, that uh, uh, or or too excessive of an emotional intimacy uh, between individuals who aren't married, uh, that would be inordinate. It would be immoderate. It would be excessive. That is outside the bounds of what God says that love should be. And it says there, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. So these are described as fleshly things that Christians aren't supposed to have anything to do with. They're supposed to be, well, mortify means to put to death. I'm not talking, not putting to death to people, but putting to death. These things are not to, to have any part of our lives. Fornication, uncleanness, and ordinate affection, all these things. And so, there is, so, so the question, or the, the answer to the statement, I don't, you know, they're not asking it as a question, they're just saying it matter-of-factly, love is love. Well, the, the fact of the matter is that's a false statement in God's eyes. Which is one reason why a lot of them don't like God to begin with, don't like the Bible, because it inconveniently goes against what their flesh is, or what their feelings are, and what their philosophy is. But the fact is, for Christians, Christians need to have the right answers. And that Christians shouldn't be parroting the same things the world does in saying that love is love. Uh, because it's not. It's not, not. it's not all equal. It's inordinate affection. It's a work of the flesh, characteristic of the flesh, not of the Spirit of God. Uh, to, now, see, here's the question then, another one. To love or not to love? You know, are we to love everything? Or there are some things we're not to love, not to have that close affection, that, that deep affection for an attachment to. Well, let's go to 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and we'll see something that we are not to love. 1 John chapter 2. <coughs> Verse 
1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. So there's a command. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So, verse 15, love not the world. What is it talking about? Is it talking about the people of the world? No, it's not talking about the people of the world. It's talking about the world system and the characteristics of this world because it's described of all that is in the world. So, we're talking about the world system, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So, those things that are opposite of love, it's lust. It's things that, that gratify our flesh, the things that gratify our sight, our, that, that please us, but is, is more of a work of the flesh. It's not part of the fruit of the Spirit. Neither, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the Father, love, uh, from, sorry, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so this teaches that you cannot love the world and the things of the world and love God properly at the same time. So if you have too close of an, or too deep of an affection or too close of an attachment to things of this world, it, it, you cannot love God the way you should at the same time. You know, I was, I was reminded of this when um, the, the Los Angeles Dodgers, and this is Pride Month, and so many sporting events, uh, baseball, they have their Pride Nights, Pride Days, and these celebrations and all that. And so Los Angeles Dodgers uh, made news recently because they were going to be honoring a group called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which is this men dressing up as women, but not just that, but they're also doing it as, as to be blasphemous against God. And really, it's against primarily the Catholic Church because they make fun of nuns and they're dressing up as nuns and all this stuff. And it's just, but it's very sacrilegious, even though I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a Catholic and I don't, you know, agree with the the you know, core, some core parts of Catholic doctrine. Um, at the same time, it is still blasphemous because they are, in their minds, they are mocking Christianity as a whole and mocking Jesus, even though it's particularly targeted the Catholic Church. And so that created a big uproar. And so they said, "All right, well, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna back off. We're not gonna we're not gonna have this group come in anymore." But then the the Los Angeles Pride Organization said, "Well, if you're not gonna have them come in," We're going to back out of your pride day, so we're not going to participate. So then they changed their mind again. They said, well, we're re-inviting them. We're re-inviting them. So then there's a Christian, supposedly a, a apparent Christian on the Dodgers. There's, I think, a couple of them who claim to be Christians. But one of them put out an announcement, and they, they, apparently he must have gone to the Dodgers and really pushed and said, all right, we need to announce Faith and Family Night. So we need to have something else for Christians to, to focus on, you know, not just glorifying this. Because this Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence was going to be granted a Community Hero Award. So not only are you going to have them there, they're going to give them an award at their Community Heroes. Now how perverse and twisted is that? Completely. I mean, we live in an upside-down, inside-out world. Now, I am one, and I, I, I make this decision uh, on the fly each year of what I do. There are times that I will subscribe to uh, the baseball service where I can watch the out-of-market baseball games. Because I like to sit down and, and watch the baseball games. And uh, I can actually, if I'm sitting there in the living room or wherever I may be, but living room most likely... You know, I can have my laptop out and I can be working and I could have a baseball game on because it's not a fast-paced game. So kind of in the background, I'm listening to it or watching it, you know, kind of out of the corner of my eye. And I can still focus on doing other things. And that's what I've done in some years past, but I haven't done it every year. And this year I was thinking, boy, you know, um, I usually wait until they have a good sale because I'm not paying full price for the service. Uh, and they keep raising the price every year. Um, but... Um, but this year, I'm thinking, well, you know, I, this might be the year I do that again, just enjoy some baseball games. And then this came out, and I, just, I thought, I got to thinking, whether a person's a Dodger fan or not, this is, this is Major League Baseball. This is something that Major League Baseball is okay with, the whole league, and other teams have their own pride nights and all these things. And I thought, 
You know, that, there, there comes a point where I can't make an excuse for supporting them anymore. You know, I mean, any, any of us, you know, I mean, these are worldly institutions, these are worldly organizations anyway, so there's going to be plenty of flesh involved already. But then when you get to that point where you have a team at a baseball game who's giving a community hero award to the most perverse, twisted type of organization, you know, when does, when does it come to the place where in my own heart of hearts, my own conscience, I say, look, as much as I like watching the baseball, you know, my, my convictions and the principles and standing for what's right in God's word comes, comes first, where I'm not going to be giving my money to them for, for this kind of nonsense, this kind of twisted thing. And, you know, everybody has to make those kind of decisions. You know, these, are, these have to do with your convictions of, of how, how what, you know, examining it and say, well, what is the connection? You know, we have no connection to L.A., we have no connection to... But do, in, in, can I rightfully this year, uh, in my own heart, my own conscience, be giving, paying money for a service that then I'm watching something that is part of a system that is, is absolutely in rebellion against my beliefs? Now I say, well, but they're, but they're, um, but they're going to have a faith and family night. There's a difference between having a pride night and a faith and family night, and then during their pride night actually honoring a group that is that twisted and that perverse and that blasphemous. You know, so for me, that's kind of one of those things I'm stopping to think. Is like, so at what point? So there might be some Dodger fans out there, Christian Dodger fans, but yet they will still maintain their love for the Dodgers. Even with that, the, may, they might try to justify it some, you know, just, and, and for me, I, I just can't, I couldn't justify, I don't like the Dodgers anyway, to be honest with you, so it's not a problem. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, at what point do we say, you know, I just, I just really can't in good conscience I, I do this anymore. I can't, I just can't do it. And it just keeps getting more and more intense. There's that thing bug buzzing around me again. Um, it gets, but it, it, and it's getting increasingly, it's getting increasingly difficult because now it's no longer just celebrating men marrying men and women marrying women and some of the other related lifestyles. It's, it's now the big thing this year for whatever reason is the fascination with these drag shows and these drag queens. You know, so it just keeps on getting worse and worse. And that, how that's considered entertainment is beyond me. Why pe how people find that stuff entertaining is just, it just shows the depravity of, our, of the hearts of, of man. And so more and more, it becomes more and more challenging. And, and, and tough decisions have to be made of saying, look, what am I going to be associated with? What am I going to pay money for? What am I going to support? And... You can't love the things of the world and love God properly at the same time. It just, you just can't do it. It says that if, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so more and more as part of the Christian life, what's, what's necessary is for us to always be examining and say, you know, is this something that does not violate uh, my beliefs? Uh, violate godliness and holiness, or is this a step too far? And say, look, I, I can't, I can't uh, be a part of this. I'm not going to support that anymore. And so it's you know difficult decisions, difficult decisions. But something like entertainment, something like a, a ball game, is not that. That's an easier one because it's not affecting your life really for the negative at all. Because the fact is, there's plenty of other things you can do. Plenty of other good, wholesome things in life to focus on. It, uh, we don't need we don't need the professional sports leagues. We found that out during COVID. That just they're not really that important. <laughs> and so, whatever it may be that you have affection for, that you like, that you there may even be some things that that are in this world that may not be sinful, but they are still of this world. And 
and it might be inordinate affection, which means that it's excessive affection for, and it's taking the place of your love for God. But in this case, in these verses, it's talking about the things of the world, the world system, this world system that is filled with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And that covers a whole realm of things. Because notice verse 17, the world passeth away and the lust thereof. All that's going to be done away with. It's passing away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. To love or not to love. These are some things we are not to love. The things pertaining to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. You know, there, um, there might be some who say, well, I, you know, I do just do things locally that's, that's not part of these big leagues and stuff. Well, it's still possible to prioritize that and love that more, have a love for those things that are still part of the world system and uh, things that take the place of our love for God. You can't do both at the same time. Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 when the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now, um, would there be anybody here who would say, I have reached the point that I love God. Now, knowing what we know about love and the definition of love, is there anybody, could we say, that I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all thy mind? Can we really, could we, any of us really say that? That I mean, that, you know, God has my entire heart, soul, and mind. It, you know, that, that is completely, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand here and claim that. I'd probably be lying. I'd be deceiving myself or deceiving you to say, yes, I, I, I am satisfied with where I'm at in my love for God. Because remember, love is, is an action. Love is what gives. Love is what does. And if I still have parts of my life, corners of my life, shelves in my life, areas, closets in my life, where I have affection, too much affection for other things that then is taking the place of my love for God and and as a result, my walk with him, then I can't really say I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind if you equate it to an action, to a daily lifestyle. Now, we might in our hearts, we might say that, oh, yeah, oh, yes, I do love God. I do love God. We should, and we should. But when you ma measure it up with saying, yeah, but what actually in my practical life takes first place in my life? What are things that are crowding out my walk with God, my time with God, my relationship with God that are of this world that are just have too much of my affection? That's where we need to examine that. Because you might say, well, I, I don't like the Los Angeles Dodgers anyway. I don't like Major League Baseball anyway. I don't watch professional sports. I don't do that. It doesn't matter what it is. There's, every one of us has different areas in our lives where we can have inordinate affection. We can have things that we love too much that are part of this world system that then take the place of loving God. Uh, and so he says, this is the first and great commandment. Verse 39, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so this is where the loving your neighbor part comes in. So the first one is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Then love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. So everything else that comes into play in the law and the prophets is based on your love for God and love for neighbor, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Because let's face it, if, if I love God like I should, that's going to affect my lifestyle. It's going to affect the things that I say and do and the way that I live. If I love my neighbor as myself, it's also going to affect how I treat them. 
you know, if you love your neighbor as yourself, uh, you're, you, at the time that you, if you're exercising love for them, you're not going to be stealing from them at the same time. Or you're not going to be lying to them at the same time. You're not, you know, murder. You know, think about murder. Somebody who murders somebody is not loving their neighbor as themselves at that moment in time. And so it is with its God, it's with God and with others, is that in that moment, if we are exercising, we have proper love in our hearts that then is being lived out, then there's no issue in fulfilling the law, in keeping the Ten Commandments and other aspects of the law, because we're not going to bear false witness against our neighbor if we love our neighbor as ourself. Uh, we're not going to covet our neighbor's wife if we love our neighbor as ourself. Those, those things fall right into place if you have proper love for God and love for others. It's not like um, we have to force us, oh, i got to try not to, um, I'm going to try not to lie to this person today. Well, you could do it that way. You could try to strain yourself and make a big effort to do, or you could ask yourself the question, examine your life, say, do I, do I properly love this person? You know what, I'm going to have some love in my heart for this person, and you'll find that uh, it'd be a lot harder to lie to them or steal from them if you have proper love in your heart. Same thing in, in marriage relationships. If, we, uh, if, if a husband loves his wife like he should, a wife loves her husband like she should, it'll affect, the, it'll affect actions and words and, and uh, the whole dynamic of the relationship if there's proper love there. And, um, and, so, and it doesn't mean that, and, and if, you know, if, if you don't see somebody treating you like, oh, that's not, you're not treating me very loving, doesn't mean they don't love you at all. It just means there may be need to be a bit more love there and an actual outpouring of that love, a, a, a indication of that love there, because love is what gives and it is indicated by action, what we do and give. And then turn to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, verse 43. Now how about our attitude and action toward those who don't love us? Uh, what did Jesus say in verse uh, 43? You have heard it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Like, well, it's easy to do that. I mean, there's, that's not really a great accomplishment. Yeah, this person loves me, I'm going to love them back. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's nice, that's good, but I mean, really, that's not all of that difficult. Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And so we need to have a complete, mature, perfect love, not something that's a selective love. You know, it'd be like, um, you know, it's, it's ho hopefully it's easy to love people here within the church. Hopefully. <laughs> but what about people out there? So you might have, you might, it might be easy, oh yeah, and show affection and love for people inside the church, but then you might treat the people outside the church a bit different. It's like, I don't love them, I don't, you know, even, but one of the greatest evidences of God's working in your life and the Holy Spirit's control in your life is when you can come to the place where you follow what Jesus said here, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. I mean, that is, that stands the tallest out of all the kinds of love is when you can actually do that, love your enemies, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. He says that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Why? Because that's how God is. God so love the world. So God has, he, he demonstrated his love for the whole world by Christ going to the cross. Now they are going to have to, the, the wicked world, the lost world is going to have to stand before God in judgment and face uh, the punishment for their sin. But, 
as far as what God wants for them, God still wants the best for them. He wants them to come to him in faith and get forgiveness, to, to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ himself set the uh, earthly example when he went to the cross. And he didn't lash out against those who were beating him and those who were putting the crown of thorns in his head and those who were uh, putting the nails in his hands and his feet. He did not lash out at all. He didn't speak a word against them. He is, he set, so he set that example. And so we, if we're going to be perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect, then we are to have a complete love like Christ had a complete love. It's not easy, but that's not really the point. That's not really the point. Nobody at this point, at this time, is putting us on the cross and beating us and putting a crown of thorns on. So, I mean, if any of us say, well, you know, it's not easy. Well, look at Jesus' example, and he would say, yeah, it's, humanly speaking, it's not easy. <laughs> and he, of course, being God, uh, didn't have a problem doing that. But in his humanity, I mean, we'd say, boy, that's, that's a hard thing to not lash out, not speak against, and not have a problem with those people as far as a human, you know, uh, a human hatred for them. Because uh, the Bible says, For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So notice the completeness of God's goodness. Is that the same sunrise that we had this morning, the sun that shines down on us today, the, the rain that comes, it's, it's equal opportunity. It doesn't just rain right where the Christians are and then there's no rain right where the unbelievers are. Oh, did it? Oh, now, the other day there were scattered storms, so some people might have gotten rain and some didn't. But on, I could tell you on the same street where there might be a Christian living next to a non-Christian, God didn't stop the rain over that non-Christian's house. They all got God's goodness of rain and we all get God's goodness of the sun rising and setting each day where... Uh, we have another day of life. And so in that regard, everybody is a recipient of God's grace, His favor. Not everybody has God's saving grace upon their lives. They're not believers. They can, they can experience the grace of God and salvation. Uh, but they, we are all beneficiaries of God's goodness, God's grace, just by being able to live and breathe and have what we do each day, whether a person's a believer or not. And so just as God shows his goodness to all people in those ways, we then, to be like the Father, then need to have a completeness in our love and goodness to others. It doesn't mean that we are we're, uh, supporting evil or supporting unrighteousness. It's simply what is, how do we treat fellow man? What is our heart's attitude supposed to be to fellow man? And it's one to be, a, to love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. Think about um, those who are persecuted Christians and they have enemies everywhere. One of the greatest testimonies for Christ is when those who are being persecuted take it patiently and they actually show love and kindness to their persecutors. That, that's huge. That, that is one of the most ultimate testimonies. Why? Because the world's way is that you just lash out and you get revenge and you, you know, I mean, and, and in the world's eyes, you're perfectly justified. I mean, look what this person did to you. Look what these people are doing to you. But God's way is a different way. God has a different way of dealing with things and wants us to deal with things in a different way. And if you allow love to be the center and controlling force in your life, then it's not a matter of what people are doing. It's a matter of you simply being consistent in who you are. That I'm not going to let what other people do dictate what I do and say and dictate my heart attitude toward them. Um, another question here of what about evil? 
the final uh, question here. What about evil? You know, they say, well, there's so much evil in the world, and shouldn't we be doing something about it? Can't we fight back? Can't we take up arms? Can't we, you know, don't we need another revolution? Don't we need, uh, you know, shouldn't we be, um, you know, there are people who take things in their own hands, and they'll go and shoot up places. They'll go and just just lash out and, and do all these things. And um, what, what, is, what should be our response to evil? Uh, Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So, we are not to exchange evil for evil. Well, this person did this to me, so I'm going to get back at them. That's what that is. Now, let me make it very clear. I'm okay, I, and I believe you know, God is okay with defending yourself. You know, if you get, I mean, if you get attacked, you don't necessarily just have to um, you know, stand there and say, oh, yeah, hit me. I mean, you can get away or you can try to shield off you know, attacking. But the, the issue what he's, we're dealing with here is not exchanging evil for evil while getting back at somebody. Um, as we see other examples in Scripture of righteous people, God using righteous people uh, for the uh, for the doing of good and the restraint of evil. Uh, Abraham, when when Sodom and Gomorrah were uh, taken, uh, when Lot was taken captive with the people there of Sodom, and Abraham took his men and he went out and they got everybody back. They got everybody back. He wasn't recompensing evil for evil. He was just trying to get back what had been taken. So we're not talking about uh, proper issues of defense and, and protecting other people here. We're talking about the aspect of revenge and exchanging evil for evil. I'm going to get back at them and I'm going to pay you back. Payback time. It's payback time. But it says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So we're not to be, uh, our actions, our lives are not to be dictated based on whether people do evil or good to us. We need to be consistent in our lives based on what God says we should be like. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, verse 18. So, and this is a great verse. Because it says, if it be possible... Now, if someone comes up and starts attacking me, well, it isn't possible anymore because I got to defend myself somehow. <laughs> but I'm not going to try to be an instigator, and I'm not going to try to get revenge and payback against somebody. It's just it just so happens as if, I, if, if the rubber hits the road and there's defense that needs to be made, well, we got to do what we got to do in a particular situation. But it's not possible anymore because somebody's not going not to live peaceably with me. But when it comes to arguments, when it comes to uh, different things, it does take two to keep an argument going. It gets kind of silly when only one person keeps an argument going. It sounds, sounds really silly. And by the way, if they, if they insist on keeping going, let them keep going. Maybe they'll figure out how silly it is. Don't let them be the dictator of you saying things out of line or doing things out of line. Uh, but if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, I mean, so as much as humanly possible, as much as, as absolutely possible, I'm going to live peaceably with all men. And that would, and really, and we, by the way, we need this verse more than ever in America now. Yeah. I mean, we do. And it's for people who are on the side of right and, you know, biblical right and on the side of wrong either. It doesn't matter which side of issues we need that, and especially Christians need to follow this, that my desire is as much as I can to live peaceably with all men. Now, I was thinking of this, uh, of, of how we can stand for right and, and, and still try to live peaceably. 
one of the, the accusations that's given to the whole L, to the LG, LGBT movement, especially the transgender issues and the drag people, you know, all that uh, stuff, is that, that they call them groomers. They're grooming children, grooming people. Now, I, I, I get it, I understand, but what, what that, that word, it, it does not, now it might sound real good, it might sound real strong, like you're getting a point across, but the issue is, among a large segment of the population now, that word is a very toxic word. So it's like you're not going to generally win an argument and, and make your case properly if you're just throwing out the word groomers and groom because they can they just deny. It's like, we're not grooming people. What are we doing? You know, we're not grooming them. We're just... And you know what the answer is? I'm going to try to live peaceably with as many people as I can and I'm not going to be thrown out those types of labels and accusations. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, here's what's right and here's what's wrong. You don't need to throw those words out there that sound real good, sound real catchy, is that it's simply if it's right, it's right, and if it's wrong, it's wrong, whether they're grooming people or not. And I guess it depends whether they are, it depends on what your definition of grooming is. But, I mean, we, we should take a stand for our children. But it's simply a matter of a declaration of here's what's right, here's what's wrong, here's what's n normal, here's what's perverse from the standard that God has set, and here's what's the standard of God's based on God's human design. And so I'm going to try to live peaceably, but at the same time, and it does say provide things honest in the sight of all men, that just means you're, you're true and honest, you're straightforward with uh, not... Not recompense evil for evil, but just providing things honest in the sight of all men. Let your yea be yea, nay be nay. Uh, and then as we move on from verse 18 where it says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That, that verse covers a lot. But then it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And one of the greatest forces to make a difference is, is the force of good. Overcoming evil with good. Not trying to get back at people. Not trying to stir things up. Not trying to... Uh, to, to instigate problems and violence and arguments and hard feelings and all of that. Uh, it's simply, what a, the greatest testimony is when somebody knows that, uh, you know, that, I mean, you're at odds with somebody and they've made themselves your enemy and they may even do evil to you and that you respond in the opposite way and not returning evil to them. That is a tremendously powerful thing because that goes completely against human nature. It goes completely against human nature. It really does. And so, as much as the word love has gotten hijacked, love is still a vital part of our faith, our Christian life. It's a vital part, a necessary part. Um, I realize it's come almost all the way at the end of the series. You know, it's, it's not... We don't look at love in a lot of ways the same way. Oh, yeah, we, here's what we believe about the deity of Christ. Here's what we believe about salvation. Here's what we believe about justification and creation and all these things. So we think about those. And those are just, those are beliefs that we have. But love is not just a belief, but it's something that then gets put into action. And, you know, how can you argue with love being an important doctrine of the faith when loving God with all your heart is the first and great commandment? Say, well, that, that might just have to be right at the top of of what we believe because that's the first and greatest commandment and to love our neighbor as ourself. And we need God's help in having this fruit of the Spirit because, as I said, our human nature necess doesn't necessarily want to respond in kind, to, uh, doesn't want to respond with kindness or in love to people, but to respond in kind when there's evil done to us or said to us. 
Or the other part of it is, then people go, they overcompensate. It's possible to overcompensate and that all of a sudden your love turns into emotionalism where you just don't want to take a stand for anything because oh, I just love these people too much and you know I just care about them so much and I just can't do anything to hurt them and, and I don't want to take a stand. I don't want to disagree with them. And so oftentimes what happens is then people vacillate to the opposite extreme. So there's the, op there's the extreme of lashing out and taking revenge and they've done evil to me. And then there's just others and, you know, oh, I, I, just, I just love them so much and I, I, I don't want, it turns into more of an emotionalism rather than the proper biblical love. And so we need to have God's help in the matter that we remain grounded on the truth of God's word, but it's all underpinned, it's all the, under, on the foundation of love for God like we should and love for others. And that our love for others is not mistaken as a support of, of evil or a support of, of wickedness, but that just simply from human to human, fellow man to fellow man, that we do have love for them, we have goodwill toward them, we want what's best for them. And for the lost and dying world, the best thing for them is to repent of their sins and to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith for salvation. That's the best thing. I want the best for you. I want you to be saved. I want you to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the ultimate uh, love we can have for others is that great message of salvation and the greatest love that God had for the world, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the ultimate, the ultimate show of love. The ultimate love for the world was that he gave. So once again, that running theme is it's what we give, not what we get. Love is about what we give. And uh, maybe there's just somebody you have a hard time loving. I mean, we could all probably point to people and say, you know, there are just some people that aren't very lovable. You know, the fact is, there are. There are. And the fact is, there's some things about us that probably aren't very lovable either. <laughs> we all have our areas. But um, let's look at it as, here, here, think of this as, first of all, as a command, because that's what it is. Jesus, the first command. Nation of Israel, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and then love thy neighbor as thyself. So you look at it, first of all, that my faith commands it. My faith commands it. My faith demands it that I, that I love. And that then also we would not have an attitude of, then the greatest test, the greatest challenge then comes when we're faced with evil, when we're faced with opposition, when we're faced with persecution, when we're faced with that. How do we respond? Not just by our mouths and by our actions, but how, what is our heart attitude toward those people? Is it one of hatred, one of wanting vengeance and judgment? Well, if it is, we need to step back from that and say, you know, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So we can move on from that when we leave vengeance and the repayment and justice in the hands of wh who it belongs, which is God. And but guess what? He can do a whole lot better job than we can anyway. And we just continue on and say, you know what? I'm not going to let the way another person treats me be the determining factor of what's in my heart regarding love. I'm going to let God be the determining factor. I'm going to let His Word. I'm going to make the deliberate choice. I'm just going to follow God and His Word and what He wants me to do no matter what. And with His grace, we can do it. And we can reflect that love that God showed by giving His only begotten Son. And the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love. First one, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, love. Fruit of, the, fruit of the Spirit. So if we're filled with the Spirit, guided and controlled by the Spirit, love should be right there at the top of the list. The first, the first thing that it comes out of our life is being filled with the Spirit. So who, who do you need to have some love in your heart for today? Maybe there's somebody you need to show some love today. Uh, maybe you need to um, look at your life and say, you know, I, boy, do I love God like I should? Boy, I just want to love God like I should. 
And there's some areas where I love too much of the world and I'm, I'm not loving God enough and just these things of the world are crowding out my love for God. Whatever it may be today, let's increase in our love for God, love for others, and fulfill the greatest commandments.